Today we're going to talk about standing firm in our faith. And, uh, the verse that came to my mind to start with was Psalm 130, verse 3, that says, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? And I know that I could not stand if the Lord marked my iniquities, but only through the grace and mercy of um, Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for me can I stand here and can I stand firm in anything that I do or that I say. And so I give him all the praise and glory before I start <laughs> today. Um, so in my process of knowing God and believing God and learning to trust God and his plan, I have spent many seasons being blown and tossed by the wind. I have lived through stormy seasons where I felt very, very lost at sea. I did pursue most seasons of my life, mostly confused. And as I look back, I still don't really understand what my life's purpose was designed to be through that. I read books. That was kind of my escape. A lot of fictional books like Nancy Drew. Who wouldn't want to be Nancy Drew? She <laughs> saved all the underdogs. She was kind and friendly to everyone. She had two great friends, and she always won, but she was always kind and gentle and persevering, so smart. Um, so who wouldn't want to be Nancy Drew? Uh, Judy Bloom, who took all of life's awful antics and made them humorous and funny. Um, I guess the movie, Are We There, God? It's Me, Margaret, is actually coming to the theaters now. Yeah, that should be interesting. Um, Let's see, Stephen King, so I got my horror thrill. <laughs> read, um, I read a lot of nonfiction books. I read the um, Johnny Eric, uh, yeah, Johnny Erickson. That's the right last name, right? Yeah, Johnny Tata Erickson. I read her book when she was younger, and uh, a book called Child of Satan, Child of God, which is a, a Charles Manson um, story of Susan Tate, who was a part of that and her redemptive story. I read a book called The Persecutor, which is about a Russian man who was persecuting the Christians in Russia and slowly became transformed by the power of Christ and turned to Christ after he had spent most of his life persecuting and terrorizing Christians in Russia. Um, I read a book called Tested by Fire, which was about a man who also was burned terribly, and many other biographies about tragic accidents and recoveries. But all of these were stories of God's redemptive work in great brokenness. I always had frequent flyer miles at the church library. So I read all these things, I believe, as an attempt to find my identity, I, especially an identity that I could understand or that I could kind of duplicate. Um, I was waiting for my own tragic event to build my faith in Jesus because I thought that you had to have something awful happen to meet him, I guess. I don't, I don't really know why I had this confusion, but I was just waiting for something awful to happen. And I haven't had a lot of tragic events. I've just had life, and it's still been hard. Uh, when I read, I find that I experience the characters, um, not necessarily the settings. My husband reads books and he sees a movie going. I see feelings and people, and I experience the characters and their actions, their reactions. Uh, I am emotionally experiencing the journey completely of the characters. Uh, Proverbs 16.1 says, The preparation of the heart comes from man but the answer comes from the Lord. So God was using all this stuff to prepare my heart. I didn't really understand it, but God has given me an answer here as I stand here to tell you about standing firm. Um, as a child, I didn't really understand Jesus' power of salvation or the joy that there is in salvation. I only saw that Jesus' perfection and I didn't understand the simpleness of Jesus' message or actually the actual cost, the suffering that he had as he sacrificed himself on the cross. And that he did that 100% for me. If it was just me, he would still have done it. 
but he did that for you as well. He did this to give me the strength through the Holy Spirit to stand firm in my faith. And because of that incredible, incredible sacrifice, I can live an empowered life. The Holy Spirit strengthens me to stand firm through the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, and only that. So how can we stand firm in the truth? When it seems that the evil in this world is glorified, when minds are under assault through the internet and through our education system, when children are constantly being hurt and bullied, when God is pushed aside in our society, when everyone has the right to be right, when every offense requires compensation, <coughs> when every feeling needs to be considered true, when everyone's identity is up to one's choosing, and even when integrity doesn't seem to matter, how do we stand firm in our faith? Well, the characters of Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are a story that came to mind as I was considering <coughs> a characters that stood firm in the Bible. They were exiled to Babylon from their home, and they stood firm to start with in their diet standards. They decided that they did not want to defile God's design for their bodies, and they asked to not have to eat the specialty foods of the king that were being required for these exiled youths to eat and they stood firm in asking for that request and in so doing they ended up healthier but it was a gift from God there's no guarantee that the food that they ate made them better it was just a gift from God as they decided not to defile themselves and obey the rules of, that God had given to them and they came out and they stood firm in their convictions healthier than all the others around them. So they also stood firm in not bowing down to idols. There was a time when the king decided to build an idol and told everyone had to bow down and worship this idol. And they would not bow down. And because they did not bow down, they were thrown into a fiery furnace. And in being thrown in the fiery furnace, they could have died, which would have been fine for them because they knew that their hope was in God. So to die in the fiery furnace would have been fine to them, but they did not. They weren't even burned. They weren't even scorched. They didn't even smell like fire. The people who threw them in, the soldiers who threw them in the fire, they did die, but they did not. And they were protected because God protected them because they stood firm in their conviction in, in God. Um, they also stood firm, or Daniel did, when he prayed diligently to God, even when the law had been passed, that you could not pray <coughs> any longer to any to the one true God. And he continued to do it unashamedly. And therefore he was thrown in the lion's den. And when he was thrown into the lion's den, God closed the mouth of the lion. So where do you feel that you might be being thrown into the fiery furnace? Or you might need to stand firm and trust that you will not get burned. And do you feel maybe that you might be thrown into a lion's den sometimes? When I go to work, sometimes I feel like I'm going into the lion's den. And it is tough. And that is a lot of where this lesson came from. Because I feel as if I'm going into a lion's den when I go to work, I had to determine a way that I could find a way to stand firm and not just wither away in the environment. So, to stand firm, we must first know the truth. John 14, 6. Jesus answered and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We need to know the truth, and the only truth is Jesus. There, there can only be one truth, because if there's two truths, one of them can't be true. There's only one truth, and Jesus is that truth. To stand firm and walk in God's way, it will look opposite of the world's view of wisdom. <coughs> in James 1, 5 through 8, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man will not receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. 
A lot of my conviction in determining to pursue God really had to do some of with the consequences of not pursuing God. I really don't like being blown and tossed by the wind, and I don't like considering myself double-minded. So I have to choose to trust in God and stand firm in His truth and to know that He will give me the wisdom. And then I need to stand firm on it and not decide that it took too long to get there, and I have to wait on Him. And I've had to wait, and when I haven't waited, I do get double-minded, and I get all wishy-washy, and I get anxious, and I go through a lot of things that I wouldn't have to if I would just wait and trust in His wisdom, and then I wouldn't have to be blown and tossed by the wind. Um, and Romans 12, 1 through 2 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We have to walk in an opposite mindset of the world. Um, in this verse, I had a... Christian comedian talk about this verse as the oxymoron that being a living sacrifice is. Because a living thing is alive. A sacrifice is dead. They're opposite things. How can a sacrifice be alive? But it is. Because we are to be alive to Christ but dead to our sin. And we can be only by the strength we have in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So we must walk in the opposite mindset living in obedience to Christ but dead to our selfish desires that go against God's design and say yes to him. God's commands are not burdensome. They're always for our good. They always will. Um, I always remember learning the verse about children obey your parents in the Lord and honor your father and mother. But in the end, they always forgot to tell you because then it will go well for you. Um, you get the first part. Okay, you got to honor, you got to obey. But the reason you do that is so it will go well for you. In this verse, it says, so that you can know God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. And so that you can know how to be true and properly worship Him. And to not be conformed to the pattern of this world. So that your mind can be renewed. So that you can be filled with the knowledge of Christ. So also, to stand firm, we must believe in the promise of God. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because, having stood the test, this person will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. This is one of the promises God has given us. If we persevere under trial, not if we get trial, when we get trial, if we persevere, he promises us this crown of life. And this crown of life is with him, with him in glory. The hope of glory is what holds us um, standing firm. So to stand firm, we also must believe that he calms the storms. That when we get stirred up and when life gets challenging, he does calm the storms. There's a story in Mark 4, 35 through 41, where the disciples and Jesus are crossing the lake. And a furious, furious storm comes up and is crashing over the boat, the waves are crashing, and it's nearly swamped, and amazingly enough, Jesus is sleeping. Who wants to sleep through the storms? I want to sleep through the storms. And Jesus is sleeping, and the dis disciples wake Jesus up in a panic, and Jesus just tells the waves, quiet, be still. The wind dies down, and it is completely calm. So he said to the disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And the disciples exclaimed, Who is this? Even the winds and the sea obey him. My God is the God with his voice who commanded the world to be, and he can calm the physical storms in the ocean. He can calm the physical storms in my life. As I have allowed myself to be tossed to and fro. I have clung to this verse when I start to get stirred up to know that God calms the storm. The storm may still be blowing, 
but I can be with what they call the eye of the storm, where it is still. And it can still be going, but God is with me, and I can be calm and peaceful, waiting for his resolution. And whatever happens, I win. What does Paul say? To live is Christ, to die is gain. So it's a win. It's victorious no matter what. And Proverbs 10.25 says, When the storm has swept by, the wicked are gone, but the righteous stand firm forever. To stand firm, we must believe there is an enemy, the devil. He's there. 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9, we've talked about this frequently. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. We are all going through trials. If you are standing firm with Christ, you have a bullseye. You should expect um, the challenges in this world because he needs to take you down because he does not want Christ to be glorified. So be prepared and be alert. And, be pre and know there is an enemy out there, a real one. So to do this, we need to be battle ready. To stand firm, we must be battle ready. Um, when I got into this issue with my job, I heard a story about Jericho. And in, if you know the Battle of Jericho, uh, they, God told them to walk around Jericho once for six days and seven times on the seventh day. And they prayed, and then the walls would fall down. So I decided that's the plan. <laughs> so I started, and I walked around where I work on the outside of the building for the six days. And on the seventh day, it's a long way on the seventh day, let me tell you. Um, and so on the seventh day, I did the seven days. And the, trust me, the walls did not fall down. Mm -hmm. But the walls for me fell down. It didn't really change the environment that much. But the prayer changed me. And so in the seven days, I did it. And I was like, OK, I did that. Things have changed. And then I realized a couple of weeks later, going, why did I stop? So I started again. And I walk around the building, and I pray. And I start with the Lord's Prayer and get myself praising God and, and remembering all he's done for me and cleansing myself. And then I walk into the armor of God to get battle ready. So I can go in there and be a presence, to be strong, and to make fewer mistakes, usually with my mouth, um, than I might have otherwise because I go in more prepared. At least I don't start off. It takes me a little while to work my way up to it. Uh, but anyway, so I started putting on this armor of God every day before I go to work. And then I memorize Psalm 139. And then I remember who I am in Christ, that I am his. That he even knows the words that are coming out of my mouth before I say them. And I keep adding to that, would you please stop some of them? Please stop. Please stop some of them. They just come out so fast. Um, anyway, there is a man, his name is Ray Pritchard. He's part of Keep Believing, Keep Believing Ministries. And he has a downloadable pamphlet on how to put on the armor of God. And I have a couple little stories from him that will come from that pamphlet as I go through this. So, so we need to be battle ready. So Ephesians 6.10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. When I found this verse about fighting against, that we're not struggling against flesh and blood, it gave me a whole new perspective of people. I started to realize that my battle was not against the people around me. Um, I probably battled my husband the most, and um, and anyone else I took out, you know, they weren't that close. I didn't live with them, but I had to really realize 
that my battle wasn't with him, that when we were fighting or when there was an issue, it really was the devil wanting to stir things up. And uh, it, it kind of has helped change my perspective and my expectation of him as well, which I think has, real, has helped in this later season of our marriage. So I also began to see all people through a new lens. I could walk around finally and stop assessing and judging everyone I was seeing, whether they were taking my parking spot or <laughs> cutting me off on the road. I started to realize that there are three things about people that I could stand firm as, on as true. One, they're all made in the image of God. God made man in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Every single person has the fingerprint of God on them. And I could start looking at people no matter what they did or who they are or how I experienced them that they are precious to God, made in his image. And I just look around this room and see such incredible creativity just in this room. And we are not very many people. So God's creativity in the whole world is so extravagant. It just blows my mind on how incredible and amazing that God is. And he knows all of them so intimately. And we can know him intimately if we choose to. Number two, that we're all sinners. We come in that package. Romans 3.23 clearly says, For we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Romans 3.10, As it is written, there is no one righteous. No, not one. There is none who does good. No, not one. I no longer say, you know, I'm a good person. There are no good people. You might do something good, but we're not good. We're not good. We accomplish some good things. But our, the inner being of our heart is naturally sinful. And number three, we're all loved by God. Romans 5.8, God demonstrates his love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So we're all in the image of God. We're all sinners. We're all loved for God, loved by God. That is everyone. I can see that in everyone. And um, so realizing that my battle is against flesh and blood, but it's against the warfare of Satan and his demonic forces that want to trick us up and make it look like God is not worth following. He is wrong. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 6.13 says, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, you will stand. We can stand firm, but we must be prepared for battle. So first we have to put on the belt of truth. Ephesians 6.14 says, Stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and with the breastplate of righteousness in place. The belt of truth goes around the waist, and it connects all the other parts of the armor. And it's also in the center of your body, so it manages to keep everything in place. John 17, 17b says, your word is truth. And John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. As I walk around the building and I pray this verse, I clearly say, God, I put on the belt of truth. I trust in your truth, your word, and who you are being the only way and the only truth. So we need to speak this out loud. We need to speak out loud the things we know that are true. We need to put on the belt of truth to protect ourselves from the onslaught of the enemy. We need to put on the breastplate of righteousness. And for me, the breastplate, it protects my heart. It guards the heart. And above all else, we need to guard our hearts. One time when I was reading the Bible and my husband wanted me to shut the light off and go to bed, I asked God very clearly, just, I, I'm not ready to go to sleep. Let me read the next verse so that I can remember it and ponder it. And the next verse, I don't even know, I think it's in Proverbs. It said, my son, give me your heart. 
God is intimate. Ask him and you will receive. Matthew 22, 37 through 38 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Give him everything. And Luke 16, 13 warns us against a divided heart. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You cannot have a divided heart because the division, the, the evil will overtake the good. It's very similar to the verse um, that says, oh shoot, I lost it. <laughs> Sorry, there's a verse in the Bible that talks about having good friends. And uh, bad company corrupts good morals. That's the verse. Bad company corrupts good morals. And you can't, you can be a part of it, but if it, it absorbs you, it will start to overtake you. And so devote your, devote your hearts to God. So put on that breastplate of righteousness. So put on the shoes of the gospel of peace. Ephesians 6.15 says, And with your feet, fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. John 14.27 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. I like peace. <laughs> I do. I really like peace. <laughs> um, and of course... I, I wasn't really going to throw in Galatians 5, 23 and 24, but, or 22 and 23, but how can you not? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. <sighs> yes. I love that. I love that. Put that on every day. And Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. I want to be called a child of God by my father, my heavenly father. So Ray Pritchard in his pamphlet says, if we panic, it means we have forgotten who runs the universe. Christians ought to be the calmest people on earth because we know the Lord and he holds the future in his hands. There is no panic in heaven no matter what happens on earth. The devil will do what he can do to distract us through fear and discouragement. But God gave us the shoes we need to stand firm in the heat of the battle. When fear threatens to overwhelm you, put on the shoes of the gospel of peace. Put on your shoes. Next, pick up and put on the shield of faith. Ephesians 6.16 In addition to all this, Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts and arrows of the evil one. We need to be prepared to pray immediately in the moment for the fiery darts that Satan sends at us and to use our shield to deflect them. The fiery darts sneak up on me through my doubt and insecurity I will find my mind dwelling on a circumstance that's outside of my control until I become the fiery dart <coughs> who is throwing darts at somebody else. So it can go both ways. So I have to pray when I go around the building that I could punch the fiery darts that are coming at me and I would not throw any. Um, so this is where I spend the time and I pray for those that I work with who appear to be enemies against me. Uh, you would think that it wouldn't be this complicated, but for some reason it is. There are people involved, that's why. <laughs> Matthew 5.44 tells me, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Because if we just love those we like and pray for those we like, aren't we just doing what everyone else does, whether they believe in God or not. They like they take care of the people they like. But if we pray for those who are our enemies, and we pray for that they would come to repentance, and we pray that something would break 
in their hearts, that there would be a crack in their hearts, that our light might shine through. That's what I pray for. That's what I pray I can stand firm doing there. Finally, let's put on the helmet of salvation. Let's protect those minds. Ephesians 6.17 says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So the helmet protects the mind, and it always reminds me that I am freed forever from the punishment of my sin. The helmet of salvation reminds me that I am free from the punishment of my, son, of my sin. And Colossians 3 tells me to set my mind on things above, not on the earthly things, for I have died, and my life is now hidden with Christ in God. <coughs> So we pick up the sword of the spirit. As you'll notice, this is our only offensive weapon. Everything else that we've picked up so far is we are defending ourselves. God gives us one tool that is an offensive tool in the battle. It is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Hebrews 4, 12 through 13 describes the word of God like this. The word of God is alive and active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing the soul and the spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And as I pray around the building, I ask God to search my heart and test me and know my anxious thoughts, to point out anything in me that offends him, and that he would lead me in the path of everlasting life, that he would cleanse my heart so that I would go into the battle purified for him. Because um, he knows, he knows my heart, he knows the inner parts of me, he knows what I'm thinking, he knows when my thoughts are pure and when my heart is pure and when it is selfish and self-absorbed and looking for self, um, selfish things, just self-adoration or whatever. I find that happens less and less the more I get to know God. But I do know, once again, this is where memorizing scripture is the key so that you can have arrow, it, that they just come to you. It, it doesn't matter if they make sense. They, in the circumstance. It's just knowing, blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. I can't stay discouraged when I know that. The Lord is my shepherd. Um, there's so many um, opportunities to know, um, just to know more and to be prepared more. I know I'm not getting it wrong when it is the word of God. Yeah. Um, Debbie shared with me a little bit about teaching before this, and I said, but it's just the word. It's just the word. It's not me. It's just me sharing the word that I have come to know and to love. Not even close to as much as I'd like to, but I, I just love it. Mm -hmm. I just love it. And then Ephesians 6, 18 says, I end as I'm getting back to the back door of the building, and I say, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. It's a great time to pray for all my family and friends. And then I say, pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in change. And so pray that I can declare it fearlessly as I should. I don't want to go in the building ashamed of the gospel because I have nothing else to offer. Nothing. I can be kind. I can be generous. I can be not kind. But I still only have Jesus Christ and the price that he paid for my life and the penalty that I should have to pay. So, 
On the other side, to stand firm, we must believe that Jesus gives us the victory. He will give me the victory in this, and he does, because I keep going to work. Um, every time I wake up, I think it's a bad idea. <laughs> Exodus 14, 13 says, Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you need only to be still. As women... We do not do that very well. <laughs> Neither did the Israelites. They complained and grumbled. But when they were still, guess what? The Israelites crossed the sea on dry land. And the Egyptian army followed. And guess what? They were washed away. They were completely defeated. And they didn't do anything but stand firm on God's promise to do what he said he would do. And he did it in an extravagant way. In 2 Chronicles 20, 17, you will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. This is a story about where King Jehoshaphat was told to go defeat the Moabites and the Ammonites, but he was told to go without fighting at all. The two armies, the Moabites and the Ammonites, actually fought each other, and they annihilated each other. And King Jehoshaphat went, and they were all defeated. And he didn't fight at all, didn't lose anyone in the battle, and they went by standing firm and listening to the promises of God. And 1 Corinthians 15, 54b through 58. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because that you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Stay focused on God, and whatever you're doing in the Lord, it's all going to look different because each of us have different gifts and different purposes. But do it unto the Lord, and it will never be in vain. We will see the glory of God in the things that we do. I have some little extra verses just to remind us of how amazing God wants us to stand firm. And we're just going to go through them. Luke 21, 19. Stand firm and you will win life. Who feels like they're winning at life? No one. But God says, stand firm in your faith and you will win life. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. So be careful that you don't get so reliant on your pattern that you forget to rely on God. I have found patterns in my life where well, I, know, I know how God works. And, you know, and I sort of get complacent is what I would call it. I don't not trust him. I don't not believe him. I don't love him less. I just kind of put him aside a little bit, like in my pocket instead of out front, in front of me. Um, life is so much better when he's in front of me. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. And do everything in love. Psalm 33, 11. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. There are going to be times when you don't know what's going on. Why this is happening to you. Um, why the experiences in the past have happened or anything that happens before you. But always know that God has a purpose and a plan. It is a good purpose and it is a good plan. And just stand firm and hang on to him through the experiences and he will carry you through to another season, to another time 
and you will see the goodness of God through what you went through and through where you get to. I don't think if you go back to any of the stories, say Corey Ten Boom, Johnny Erickson, any of the um, people that I've read, all of them don't know anything different except for their experiences. And the ones that I have read are so thrilled to have gotten where they got to only because they went through the fiery furnaces of the things that they had to go through. So hang on, because the plans of the Lord stand firm. Psalm 27, I'm sorry, Psalm 20, verses 7 and 8. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we will rise up and stand firm, but only in the power of Jesus Christ. I added the last part. Um, <laughs> 2 Corinthians 1.21 Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us. He set his seal of ownership on us. He put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. We have God's promise. We are sealed. We are owned by him if we believe in him. And finally, James 5.8 You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Hallelujah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes.